We're building tomorrow's memories today, right here on NBC. The afternoon begins with baseball on NBC, and today the leaders in the West, the California Angels, travel to New York, where they'll try to keep the Yankees from making up any ground on Toronto in the East, while the Blue Jays are at home against speedy Ozzie Gijan and the White Sox. Toronto leading the East by five games. Then after BC Sports presents Major League Baseball, an inside look at baseball and a preview of today's game of the week. Brought to you by Light Beer from Miller. Everything you've always wanted in a beer and less. And by Quaker State. The big Q stands for quality. Always has, always will. And hello, everyone. I'm Bill McAtee in our NBC Sports Studios in New York. We hope you're enjoying the first day of the Labor Day weekend, and we're glad you decided to spend part of it with us today. And on this weekend, which traditionally begins the stretch drive in baseball, we want to bring you up to date on action last night. In the American League, Toronto increased their lead over the Yankees to five games. The Blue Jays winning over the White Sox. The Yankees beaten by California. The Angels lead the West by two and a half. Yankee Stadium has not been friendly to teams in the West, but the Angels began to take control in the fourth as Billy Sample could not take a home run away from Jay Howe. California led 2-0. John Candelaria brought in to help the Angels down the stretch, left the game with a tender elbow, but allowed only two hits in five and a third inning. The Yankees never got on track, and the Angels win 4-1. If the Kansas City Royals were watching California's progress on the scoreboard in Texas, Charlie Huff's knuckleball must have seemed all the more frustrating. Huff went the distance on a seven-hitter. The Royals lost four to one and dropped two and a half games back in the American League West. While in Toronto, the White Sox had won five straight coming in. After Chicago took a one-nothing lead, this home run by Lloyd Mosby off Floyd Bannister in the fourth tied the score at one, Mosby's 10th home run of the year. Then in the seventh, Ernie Witt followed a Tony Fernandez triple with this single. Witt collects the RBI, and the Blue Jays were up 4-2. to two. The Terminator Tom Hankey came on to finish the job. This is the final out. Hankey collects his eighth save, and the Blue Jays become the first team in the major leagues to win 80 games. The final, 5-3, Toronto. The Yankees had cut it to three, and as you can see, they're now back to five. And we mentioned the Subway Series, the Freeway Series last week. Well, folks in Missouri are talking about the I-70 Series after the freeway linking St. Louis and Kansas City. The Mets won last night. The Cardinals lost, but they still lead by two. The Astros, playing the role of spoiler, scored early as Denny Walling's shot goes off the glove of Tommy Herr at second and into the outfield. Bill Doran scores, and Houston was out in front one nothing. Now, the Cardinals acquired Cesar Cedeno from Cincinnati this week to help them down the stretch. And in his first at-bat for Whitey Herzog, Cedeno drills this home run deep to left. But that would not be enough as Dave Smith closed the door on St. Louis with two on and two out in the bottom of the ninth. Steve Braun, the potential winning run, flies out deep. And Smith gets his 20th save of the year. Houston wins in St. Louis, 7-5. And on a chilly night in San Francisco, the Mets beat the Giants on this key play. Dan Gladden should have made the catch on Danny Heap's fly ball. And the resulting error with two out kept the inning alive. That was key because the next man up, Howard Johnson, goes into the gap in right center field. That brings home Danny Heap. And the 1-1 tie was broken. 2-1 going into the bottom of the ninth. Then with the bases loaded, two out, Ron Darling gets Gladden to fly to center field. And the Mets stop a three-game losing streak, beating the Giants 2-1. to one. Darling is 13-5. and five. And when we come back, Dave Winfield and Ernie Witt on the race in the American League East. That and a few surprises when we return to New York after these messages. No matter where you are around the country today, you'll get a chance to see either the Yankees or Toronto. So the race in the American League East will be very much a part of the story this afternoon. And joining us now from their respective ballparks, Dave Winfield of the Yankees and catcher Ernie Witt of the Blue Jays. Thank you both very much, gentlemen, for being with us. Ernie, I heard Willie Randolph referred to as the unsung hero of the Yankees. Might Ernie Witt be the unsung hero this year of the Blue Jays? Oh, I don't know. I don't uh, think so. I think we've got a lot of heroes on this ball club, and everyone's doing the job. Of course, you know, we really don't have any big names here, but everyone's contributing to the ball club to win. David, a headline in, in one of the New York papers this morning said of the Yankees, 
falling fast. Is there any sense that every time you start to make a move on the Blue Jays, something happens and you find yourself again five and six of games back? Well, we've always, uh, put it this way, Toronto's always been in the lead this year, and we've uh, kind of reduced that deficit over the last few weeks and, and month. And we have a lot of momentum uh, working in our favor. We have a lot of home games, and we look forward to the last month. Yankees have the best home record in baseball. The Blue Jays are second. Uh, you've got seven games remaining between the Blue Jays and the Yankees. You've got a four-game series here in New York coming up the 12th. Dave, how important is home cooking? Well, every game is critical at this point. You know, when you lose and they win, it's a, it's a game between us. But, uh, you know, we know we have to win just about every game. If we can maintain our home record and improve our away or road record, we'll be in very good shape. You think the Blue Jays are keeping an eye on you, maybe checking the scoreboard? I'm going to get you to address this to Ernie. <laughs> I think uh, we're both checking the scoreboard. Uh, we definitely are this last month. Ernie? We're checking the scoreboard, too. Uh, <laughs> there's no question about it. This city's gone crazy up here, and they won't let us forget about the Yankees. Uh, but the way we look at it, they've, they've been extremely hot. I think they won 17 out of 19 at one point, but we still had a four or five game lead on them. And, uh, we're, we're pretty confident up here if we can stay healthy. Uh, we know that they're knocking on the back door, but we're going to try and uh, stay them off. Ernie, I had you in a rotisserie league a couple of years ago. You weren't playing every day. And I figured I was the only one not related to you who got up every morning to see how you did in the box course. <laughs> you did pretty well. You helped me out. Well, I'm glad that I helped you out. Hopefully, I can help this ball club out win this thing this year. Thank you both very much. Ernie, good luck the rest of the way. Thank you, Dave. Bill. Try to okay. give us a good divisional race, okay? Thanks, Bill. All right. Thank you. And while the Yankees take on California, the Blue Jays play the White Sox. Dwight Gooden will go after his 21st win of the year this afternoon. Of course, last Sunday was a big day for Dwight. He won number 20. At times, Dwight seemed to be off his usual rhythm, but a mortal performance against the Padres was strong enough to make Dwight the youngest 20-game winner in history. Another record came when Don Baylor was hit for the 190th time in his career, breaking Minnie Minoso's record. And the dog days of August took their toll. This play could only confirm the plight of the Texas Rangers after pitcher Dave Stewart with two out, thinking the inning was over, threw the ball away, allowing the White Sox to score a gift run. Gary Carter of the Mets also threw the ball away after an apparent third strike was called a ball by umpire Bob Davidson. The Mets lost two to L.A. And with one out against the Pirates, perennial all-star Dale Murphy proved only human, thinking he had just put away the third out. Dale sheepishly admitted only two. And you might want to reconsider sliding into this base in Cincinnati covered with bees. Dave Concepcion among those less than thrilled with his new friends. And there was a managerial change earlier this week. Eddie Haas replaced by Bobby Wine. And since Wine has come in, the Braves have yet to lose at 5-0. Pete Rose and Pete Rose fever when we return to New York right after these messages. You may have read the story this week about the Japanese press members who planned their trip to America around the preseason prediction that Pete Rose would break Ty Cobb's record August 26th. Well, they arrived in Cincinnati Monday, only to find Rose was still a little short of the record. He's now eight hits away from equal equaling the mark, and that has stirred mounting Pete Rose fever. Here's Lynn Berman. Everywhere you look these days, there's Pete. Since Pete Rose grew up and blossomed in the television age, there is no shortage of pictures of Pete. Major League Baseball Productions, the baseball version of NFL Films, has more film and tape of Pete Rose than any other player in the history of the game. And as he approaches his milestone, the Rose Collection is budding. Just go to your local supermarket and pick up the breakfast of champions. For the first time in the history of Wheaties, there's a professional athlete on the front of the box. Lots of hustle, that's our repeat. That's why he's eating what the big boys eat. Vince Coleman got a base hit and he's down to first base. And uh, I looked at him, I said, Vince, I said, how do you run so fast? He looked at me and he says, because I eat Cheerios. I said, Cheerios? <laughs> he said, I mean Wheaties, you're on that box, right? <laughs> As the countdown continues, so does the commercialization. You can buy Pete Rose t-shirts and Pete Rose coins. You can buy a Pete Rose book and be one of only 4,000 to own a signed lithograph. We decided that there should be a plan and it should be followed. 
and it should be a, uh, a plan that uh, has class to it and that would, in the long run, do well for baseball as well as doing well for Pete. I think that there's a, there's a certain level that's very acceptable and, and uh, actually is complimentary. What we're trying to do is keep it from going, be, going over that line where, where it does become clutter and, and unproductive. You see that, uh, that you have something that's caught the imagination of, uh, of the nation because the middle-aged people see a middle-aged person doing things that only young people are supposed to do. And older people see a middle-aged person and it makes them feel better. And young people look at it and they admire this. And it's, it's what uh, Bill and I have been talking about. It's, it's what we call really a, almost an American achievement, not just a record. It's such an achievement that no less a personage than Andy Warhol is painting these giant baseball cards for the Cincinnati Museum. After I got to do it, I, I just keep seeing him in all the magazines and he's just getting so big and, uh, and everybody's waiting for him to Hit, hit the big hit, so uh, I guess I'm waiting too. And the Reds franchise itself doesn't mind the wait. Their ticket and concession sales are zooming. We have two uh, retail outlets, and their sales are uh, depending on which month, but we're uh, you know 100% up. And that's you know we have Pete. Not only is it just Pete items, but we'll put him in a Reds field jacket, and it'll sell with that. Uh, he's uh, you know it just works for us. Uh, he's he's our symbol. And these days, he's the most quoted athlete in sports. So there is an ever-increasing number of media people watching over Pete. Anybody that's got a camera or a microphone or a typewriter wants to be here when the time comes. Should it come here at Riverfront Stadium, how many media types do you expect that night? I would say it could be anywhere from uh, 175 to 300, 350. It's really hard to say. It's not that Ty Cobb didn't receive attention. He endorsed products such as the old Coke, real old, before World War I. It's just that this is the only clip of Cobb in a game in the Major League Productions library. Quite a difference in exposure for two guys with a similar number of hits. Oh, yes, the hit. I'm not going to sit here and tell you that I'm a better hitter than Ty Cobb, but I'm going to sit here and tell you I'm going to get more hits than Ty Cobb. And uh, that's the way I look at that. And uh, hopefully the hit I get that breaks the record will be a game-winning hit. Len Berman, waiting for that one special hit in Cincinnati. All right, thank you, Lenny. Uh, we want to do a little bit of business here. Originally, after baseball today, you were scheduled to see the junior middleweight title fight between Carlos Santos and Davey Moore. But an injury to Santos has postponed the fight. And instead, you'll see an interesting sports world dedicated to wrestling. From Japan, the ancient sport of sumo. And then Bob Costas will give us another look at the wild world of professional wrestling. That is coming up after baseball. But first, the Yankees and Angels or Blue Jays and White Sox. Settle in. Seven, Carlton Fisk leads the American League in homers with 33. He's bidding to become the oldest man ever to lead the American League in round trippers. Meanwhile, George Bell of the Blue Jays is emerging as an MVP candidate. Last weekend at Comiskey Park, he put on a devastating long ball show, sending two over the roof and another into the bleachers in dead center field. The veteran star Fisk. The emerging MVP candidate, Bell, both on display today as the Blue Jays host the White Sox on NBC. presents the Major League Baseball Game of the Week. 
Today, from Exhibition Stadium, it's the Chicago White Sox versus the Toronto Blue Jays. The Game of the Week is brought to you by Ford, who invites you to drive the new Ford Escort. Have you driven a Ford lately? By Miller Beer. Miller, made the American way since 1855. By the new Walker Advantage muffler. It puts rust at a disadvantage. And by Manville. 21,000 people with one goal to be America's very best supplier. Exhibition Stadium in Toronto, where last night the Blue Jays beat the White Sox, while at Yankee Stadium, the Angels were defeating New York. That means the Blue Jays lead the Yanks by five in the American League East. California, meanwhile, is two and a half up on Kansas City, with the White Sox trailing by nine in the American League West. Hi, everybody. Bob Costas along with Tony Kubek. Today's pitching pairing, Joel Davis, young right-hander, goes for Chicago. Veteran right-hander Doyle Alexander opposes him for Toronto. Tomorrow is September 1st. That means that in the last couple of days, teams have been scrambling to add roster help for the stretch drive in time to have those new additions available for postseason play. The Blue Jays are no exception. They reacquired the veteran designated hitter Cliff Johnson this week. And to talk about that with Mr. Anthony Kubek, here's Bobby Cox. All right, thank you, Robert. Bobby, I think uh, even your players were surprised yesterday when they saw the reincarnation of Cliff Johnson. When he walked into the clubhouse, even your players couldn't believe it. How'd that happen? Well, we've been working on that for a good number of days now, Tony, and he did come available, and we made the trade. And as you know, Cliff was a big uh, fan favorite here in Toronto the last two years, and we tried to sign him last year when his free agent uh, time came up, and we were unable to do that. And our productivity uh, against left-hand pitching had fallen off some, and when his name uh, popped up, we wanted to grab him right away because we feel that he might be the extra little thing that can help us win this thing. When you uh, hear talk around the American League about MVPs, you hear Ricky Henderson, Don Mattingly, George Brad, and I guess a few others. You never hear the name of your left fielder, though. Well, George Bell is certainly uh, our most valuable player right now. He's been just sensational all year, to, uh, let alone his offensive play. His defensive skills have really improved also, and I think George Bell should be in the running for MVP for sure. Five-game lead over the Yankees going into today. Is that going to be enough to get you through September, which is always a rough month because you've got a young ball club? We have a, a real young ball club, Tony. We have some experience on it now, too. But uh, the Yankees, we know, are a terrific ball club. Detroit and Baltimore aren't out of this thing yet. And, you know, we're, we're playing from day to day, and we're trying to hang on to it and improve that uh, five-game lead as much as we can. The Yankees are really trying to cut it down. So we've got our work cut out. We know we have to be real consistent from here on out. All right, Bobby, good luck to you. Thank you. We'll be back to Exhibition Stadium, Toronto, Canada, with the starting lineups after this message. Alexander has delivered the game's first pitch high and away to Rudy Law for ball one. Alexander at 13 and 8, his ERA just under four a game. And Law drills one down the right field line foul. Rudy Law began the year as the leadoff man for this club, but of late, Reed Nichols has been at the top of their lineup quite a bit because Law's on-base percentage isn't much higher than his 249 batting average. He's stolen 21 bases, but not many of them in the last couple of months because he simply hasn't been able to reach base. Tony La Russa has tried about everything to try and generate some offense out of this White Sox team. It's right-handed pitchers. They are a better hitting ball club and a better run-producing team. Garcia throws Law out. Doyle Alexander on the mound today for Toronto has been hit by the long ball an awful lot this year. He's allowed 25 home runs. 16 of them have come in this ballpark, though, a great hitter's ballpark, where most often the wind is blowing out to right field. Today it is blowing across out to left field, so it might help Alexander with all these left-handed hitters in the lineup. But in the fashion of outstanding pitchers like Robin Roberts and Ferguson Jenkins, who allowed a lot of home runs, most of the round trippers hit against Alexander have come with the bases empty. 18 of the 25 have been solos. He doesn't walk that many people. It is a great hitter's ballpark. Artificial surface that is very bouncy, short dimensions, wind usually blowing out one way or another. That may be Alexander's bread and butter pitch. That great changeup he has. That's what the wind's doing, blowing straight out to left field off Lake Ontario. 
Alexander has a better fastball than you might suspect. Little takes this one into right field. Barfield back a few steps. And that's the second out. There's an indication right there. Now, Little only has two home runs on the air. But in the summer months, that ball blows out of here. It's just about 345 or 350 to right center field. And with the wind cutting across today, it keeps that ball in the ballpark. There's a look at Tony La Russa's lineup. Alexander has disposed of Law and Little and now will face Baines, who has hit five home runs in his last nine games. Walker on deck, then Fisk, Disa, Fletcher, who had three hits last night, Guijan at shortstop, and Salazar, who played first base last night. Versatile player. He's in center field this afternoon. There is no pitcher in the game today that dissects a lineup better than Doyle Alexander before he takes the mound. He knows every hitter that he wants to pitch around. Even though his ERA is up well over three, he doesn't get hurt by the big guys in the lineup. And he'll set them down in order to begin the ball game. No score after half an inning in Toronto, and we'll be right back. Bobby Cox with a lead of five over the Yankees uses this lineup. Garcia at second base, Mosby in center field, Mullenix left-handed side of the third base platoon, George Bell the cleanup man in left, Al Oliver the DH against the right-hander, Upshaw at first base, Witt will catch, Barfield in right field, and Tony Fernandez at shortstop. Joel Davis to Garcia to open it up, and he taps it down the third base line foul. Joel Davis zipped through double-A and triple-A today with scarcely enough time to establish a mailing address. He's got the quality pitches, talking to Tom Seaver, the future Hall of Famer, and also Dave Duncan, the pitching coach. He's got a crisp fastball. Change-up looks like a palm ball as I watched him warming up. Brian Little throws Garcia out. If Davis has problems, it'll be making quality pitches within the strike zone. Defensively, behind the youngster Davis, Rudy Law, Luis Salazar has been a jack of all trades in center. Harold Baines in right, Fletcher, Ozzie Gijan, Brian Little at second, Joe Disa, Pudge Fisk behind the plate, and Joel Davis. Slider, curve, fastball. He'll sink the fastball on occasion, run it away. Tony La Russa remarks about how impressed he is by young Davis's composure on the mound and his idea of how to work hitters. He's only 20 years old, one of the youngest players in the major leagues. 6'5", 205, a native of Jacksonville, Florida. 1-0 pitch to Mosby. A ball and a strike. Mosby's been having trouble getting around on hard stuff. A little bit of a puzzle to Cito Gaston, the hitting instructor. Apparently broke his bat going back to the bat rack. Yesterday he hit a breaking ball, a slider, high in the strike zone off Bannister for a home run. Both he and Upshaw's production in the middle of the lineup has been down for the Blue Jays this year. And that's why it's surprising with Cottle struggling off and on and short relief. The Blue Jays are where they are. Surprising to a lot of people, unless you look at their team speed and their overall offense, defense, pitching. Mosby's homer got the Jays started last night in their win. They sum the Blue Jays scouts that come around. Most often they sum them up with one word when they ask, how can they have a five-game lead? They say balance. That takes in all the territory you can think of. One out. Nobody on in the 1-1 pitch. 2-1. Davis began the year at Glen Falls. That's double-A ball. And he wasn't there long. Pitched in just four games. Then up to triple-A at Buffalo. Ten appearances there. And they purchased his contract from Buffalo a few weeks ago. 3-1. and one. The stats at Buffalo were not that impressive. ERA of almost 5. 2.5 record. More base on balls than strikeouts. And look at that walk-strikeout ratio. Not very good so far in the major leagues. Full count. Well, he's got one of the masters behind the plate catching him. Take the boons, the punch fisks. You're a young pitcher. That's the kind of guy you want to throw to. Fisk is not catching a day game after a night game. He was the DH last night with Mark Hill catching. Change up. Got a high in the strike zone. 
When it comes down, it should be in Fist's glove, and it is. The amazing part of Fist that he's catching as often as he is, after having put on, what, 20, 25 pounds in the offseason with a very, very strenuous offseason conditioning program, chiropractor, personal friend, Another Dr. Nice Bill Claus, the security five, guard of Comiskey nice. Park, put him through the rigors. Well, he still works on it three, four times a week when he's at home. But he has, his bat has slowed down a little bit now. His bat slowed down, Fist says, over the last month. We've mentioned this before, but prior to this season, only Sherman Lawler for the White Sox in the early 60s had caught more than 100 games in a season past the age of 37. This year, Fisk will do it for the White Sox, and so will Bob Boone for the Angels. If you see some of the players, and if you ever see the spectators when we show them during this telecast looking away from the field, it's because there's an air show going on over Lake Ontario here at the Canadian National Exhibition Center. The Jets scooting all over the place. 2-0 to Mullenix. George Bell on deck. And there they go. It'll be like broadcasting a game from Shea Stadium in that flight pattern at LaGuardia today. Got the corner, 2-1. Rance Mullix has struggled as of late, even though he's still at 300. Blue Jays a better hitting ball club, as are the White Sox against right-handed pitchers. Because you get Mullix bat in there. Brian Little again. And the Jays, as did the White Sox, go out in order in the first. No score after one, and we'll return to Exhibition Stadium in just a moment. When the action lags on the field, the fans turn their attentions toward the air show out beyond the right field wall. Wish Lefty Gomez was here. Didn't he do that in the midst of the World Series game? Stopped the action and looked up at some planes going over. Bal Mosby Barfield, Rance Mullich, Tony Fernandez. He makes at least one good play every ball game. If he misses a game, he makes two the next day. Garcia at second base, whose range has been cut down with a little knee problem. Willie Upshot first, Ernie Witt, and Doyle Alexander. You look at the division leaders, Toronto, St. Louis, California, Los Angeles, everyone can throw some pretty good D at you. Even the Dodgers defense over last year and beginning of this year has improved considerably. Yankees defense outstanding. Well, the main thing with the Dodgers defensively is Mariano Duncan now at shortstop. Uh -huh. He's been the big improvement. Cabal's done a good job at third base also. Doyle Alexander will be 35 in less than a week, and a couple of years ago, he appeared to be washed up. The Yankees couldn't give him away. Went through waivers. Nobody claimed him. The Blue Jays signed him, had to pay him just $40,000. Yanks were obligated for the rest of the contract. He lost his first six with the Blue Jays, and it looked like they'd have to release him any day, and all of a sudden, he turned it around. Beginning August 27th of 1983, he's gone 37 and 14 since then. Well, Bobby Cox had him in... 1980 in Atlanta, and he knew that if Doyle Alexander's arm was well, which it wasn't with the Yankees, that he could pitch with that great change. And heck, they get his fastball clocked up there sometimes in the high 80s. With that great change, it looks a lot faster. Bernie Witt says that Alexander, at this stage of his career, pretty much calls his own game, and one of the keys is the variations he has off the fastball. He'll sink it, he'll cut it, he'll change speeds on it. He was throwing a knuckleball last year, and when he was in a little bit of a slump this year, he was going to 25 or 30 knuckleballs a game. He actually lost a little confidence in the fastball and the changeup. He's chucked the knuckleball almost completely now, and he throws that changeup from the side to right-handers very effectively. A drive by Greg Walker into left center, and George Bell is there. So now it'll be Fisk, and a few people think that Carlton Fisk has become a little bit home run conscious now. And of no course, question. it hasn't worked against him. He's hit 33 home runs, but some feel that he's trying to take the low outside pitch to left field more than he might. You know, the thing about it is that's where he likes to pitch, down and outside edge of the plate. That's one of the reasons, as we look at the American League home run leaders, one of the reasons why he gets hit by so many pitches. He likes to extend the arms, go down, and get the ball. He's really getting a lot more loft on his uh, swings than he did when he was up at Boston earlier in his career here. 
uppercutting a little bit more, probably, as you said, because he's home run conscious, going for the record. The difference now is he doesn't have to hit the ball that well to get it over the fence in most parks. He's so much stronger. He was always a home run threat, but never a threat to win the home run championship until this year. 2-0. Oh. Well, he is now hitting balls near the end of the bat and up near the fists off the sweet spot on the bat that are going out of the ballpark with an added strength. 3-0. Oh. Alexander hasn't walked a batter in his last three starts. That's when he was getting a lot of home runs hit off him earlier. He was getting behind in the count and having to come more to the middle of the plate. Fisk will be hitting here if he finds one he likes. Takes a strike. He thought it was high. Rocky Rowe behind the plate today. On the bases, Dale Ford at first, Larry Barnett, the crew chief at second, Tim Scheida at third. Full count now. There's where Doyle Alexander behind on the count could give you a little bit extra. This obviously 3-1 and one was sitting on the fastball. Alexander reached back for a little bit more and had the bat trailing just a little bit. Interesting to see the White Sox. Uh, they're going to sign Fisk or not, I would think, for what he's done for the franchise. Mr. Reinsdorf, the principal owner, might feel they owe him another contract. They don't owe him anything. He's had a good year for him. In fact, excellent. His run production for numbers of hits been outstanding. The way contracts are these days, and with Fisk having the kind of year he's having with the homers at age 37, it's a difficult decision. Certainly, you'd want him back for next year and maybe the year after. But the question will be if someone else is willing to offer him a four-year contract, a five-year contract, would you match the terms over that length? 3-2 pitch. Line drive, and it's over Fernandez for the game's first hit. If the White Sox do keep Fisk for next year, Tony La Russa has talked about playing him in left field as well as DHing him more frequently. They can't expect him to catch 120, 130 games again. Well, they would prefer him to play left field so that they can DH Kittle. Head down, so much of the Charlie Lau theory of hitting there. The top hand flying off the bat to give him more extension and that great head discipline. Joe Disa now, he's had just 34 at-bats, six base hits. Greg Walker has problems throwing because of an injured right shoulder, so they've been using him less at first base. Disa playing first today. Cannot take fists for granted. He has stolen 12 bases, been caught seven times. But if you let him get a walking lead and his momentum going towards second base, he'll take off and run. That's one of the reasons why... Uh, Tony La Russa is thinking next year, playing him in left field. He says he runs as well or probably better than Kittle, so he can play out there. 2-0. Earlier this year, Fisk became one of the very few catchers in big league history to steal over 100 bases. The Yankees with the early lead on the Angels. A Ron Hassey base hit drove home Ken Griffey, we're told. Almost had him leaning. His Toronto staff holds base runners on very well. Jimmy Key does. He pitched yesterday the left-hander. Steve is excellent. Mosby started back, comes in a few steps, and has it. You know, it's interesting. The Toronto Blue Jays in the American League sitting on top of the league in TVRA. Kansas City and the Yankees are the two teams right behind them. But when you think of this little band box on this turf and the two biggest ballparks in the American League, Kansas City and Yankee Stadium, it's just been marvelous with Bobby Cox and Al Woodmar, the pitching coach, have done with this pitching staff. And they've had some injuries. You know, Clancy's been out twice this year, coming out of spring training, sore arm now. Filer's gone down now. He's disabled. Leal down in the minor leagues. He was to be their third starter. So they've had their share of injuries and had to battle through them. Fletcher's second homer was one of three base hits for him last night. One and one. There have been just 61 bases stolen off 
Blue Jays pitchers and catchers. They've been caught 36 times, and that's pretty good in this day and age of running games. One and two to Fletcher. Meanwhile, the Jays themselves have stolen twice that many. They lead the American League. Fletcher broke his bat. Talk In the on-deck circle, Ozzy Gijen. Now, here we have the source of controversy. I must pronounce it Gijen because that is what you have decreed, and yet the players have begun to kid me. Kubek still making you say Gijen? Well, when you talk to Tony Armas of Venezuela, Luis Salazar here, and Ozzy Gijen himself, they say we want Gijen. Now, my experience is the opposite. <laughs> By the way, the reason for the bandage he was spiked by George Bell unintentionally last Sunday at Comiskey Park in a rundown play. My experience has been that most Latin players accept the fact that their names are going to be anglicized. I have no quarrel with you, Robert. <laughs> you would like to say Guillen? Go ahead. I'm going to say Guijan. I just want to keep the broadcast consistent, and I know I can't move you off of your position. So Guijan <laughs> it is, folks. Two and two. Fletcher, a good hit and run man with two outs. Will Tony La Russa start him? Two and two, you're going to run three and two anyway? He's not home, not going. Look at goes the bat. Scattering them in the Blue Jay dugout. That was Jeff Burrows, number 44, who had to scamper out of the way. And the new acquisition, Cliff Johnson, has the lumber. Cliff's got to be in a better frame of mind coming back to a pennant race and leaving the Texas Rangers. Double zero. They've already got a zero or an O for Oliver. Now they've got a double zero in Cliff Johnson. Talking before the ball game with some of the players from the Blue Jays are talking about how many bats are broken these days. They're just not getting the good wood anymore. They've been seeing two or three of them broken in this game already. Again, the 2-2 pitch. A call, strike three. Right on the outer edge. First strikeout for Alexander. No runs a hit. A man is left for the White Sox. Exhibition Stadium in Toronto. The Blue Jays have drawn a million eight already, averaging 31,000 per game. Leading off the second for the Blue Jays, the left fielder. Number They'd have to bring the blankets George. and parkas out in October if the Jays play host to the playoffs and possibly the World Series. Well, the same way they would have to do it in Montreal or Chicago. Milwaukee or New York. When you play the World Series in late October, it's going to be cold or cool almost any place. People forget that Toronto kind of drops down and is farther south than quite a few cities in the U.S. This guy can hit. They were trying to figure out before the ball game where they should pitch him. They know one thing. He's a good low ball hitter. You keep the ball down there to George Bell. Breaking ball, fastball, change up. He can tattoo it. The American League strike zone dropping down. They don't give you the high strike like they haven't been asking for a while. He's dangerous. Squibs one off the end of the bat. Disa fields. Davis covers, and they get him. Let's go to New York for an update. Find out what's going on with the Angels and Yankees. All right, Bob, you mentioned the score earlier. Here it is as the Yankees are on the board against California with Ken Griffey on third after a double and a sacrifice. He comes home on this two-out single by Ron Hasse into right, so they go into the top of the second. The Yankees leading, and we'll send you back to the Berlitz brothers, Costas and Kubek. Wise guy. <laughs> what a quipster this McAtee has become, huh? Uh, Here is number zero, Al Oliver. Cliff Johnson used to wear 44 here. When he returned, he found that that number belonged to Jeff Burroughs. So now Johnson is double zero. Slap back through the middle. Gijen to his left. On the run, he got it. Ozzy Gijan has made only 11 errors this year. And at least a couple of those early in the year were for a failure to touch the second base bag and pivoting on the double play. Tom Seaver talks about Gijan's great instincts and how he moves with the count in the situation without ever having been told or using charts. Seaver says, I look back even in spring training and saw the kid. He knew just exactly what I was going to throw and where. So I didn't have to move him at all. Can't teach that, folks. Just got to play an awful lot, which he has. Davis has retired five in a row as he faces Upshaw and starts him with a strike. 
You know, they compare Guillen's error total very favorably to the performance in the rookie seasons of other great White Sox shortstops. Appling, Aparicio, Carascal, all had more than twice as many errors as Guillen will wind up with this year. Of course, the conditions under which they played were very different. Appling didn't have the equipment that some of those who succeeded him did and may have played on rougher infields. But nonetheless, Guillen has opened impressively. Well, Appling had 42 his first year. Carascal, 28. Aparicio, 35. Aparicio, the first that I saw who had that glove that looked like a Sesta that you use in a highline match. Long. A lot of other players have gone to that, especially in the shortstop position now. One-two pitch. In the air to left. Easy chance for Rudy Law. For the second inning in a row, Toronto goes out one, two, three, and we'll be right back after these messages from your local station. Seaver will soon have more company in that 300-win circle. Phil Necro at 297, and Don Sutton won his 293rd last night. He'll have to wait till next year, but he should get it. I'll bet Don Sutton's happy that he decided to play this year after threatening over the winter time not to go to Oakland. This guy is hitting surprisingly well, too. They weren't sure that he'd hit more than 250, and he started very slowly. So here is Ozzy Gijen, as I have surrendered in another internal struggle with Tony Kubek. Line drive, Barfield racing over, and he gets there. In day baseball with a bright sun, this is not an easy park to get a jump on the ball. You've still got a lot of white shirts and a glare coming off the screen behind old plate. Barfield was playing a little bit toward right center field, and he runs this one down. Such outstanding speed they have in the outfield and the infield. The team that Vice President Pat Gillert tailored for this park. He wanted speed primarily, and he's gotten power along with it from those three guys. Not so much from Mosby this year, from Barfield and Bell. They're 41 and 18 at home, 39 and 30 on the road. So they've taken advantage of Exhibition Stadium. They're the only team in the American League East that plays on artificial turf. And 21 of the remaining 33 games, counting today, are going to be played right here at home. A one pitch to Salazar. Alexander quickly ahead of him, 0-2. Salazar had never played first base before this season. He's played there three or four times in the last couple of weeks for Tony La Russa and in center field today. Versatile guy, good guy to have on a ball club. Slap to the right side, and Damaso Garcia shows good range in throwing him out. A changeup that was high in the strike zone. But even at that, Salazar was slightly fooled, tried to go the opposite way. Garcia, one of these second basemen who, because of his loping, his lengthy stride, does not appear to be covering a lot of ground. But he eats it up. Law grounded to Garcia in the first inning, strike one to him. Two years ago, he stole a White Sox record, 77 bases. In that same year, Julio Cruz stole over 50. Law leads the Sox with just 21 this year. And that's a base hit. So a chance to run here as he's aboard with two out. Let's pause briefly for station identification on the NBC television network. Bob Costas and Tony Kubek in Toronto. The Blue Jays in front of the Yanks by five in the American League East. And of course, we'll keep you abreast of what's happening at Yankee Stadium, where at last report, New York had a one nothing lead on California. The Angels are two and a half up on Kansas City, six ahead of Oakland, and nine in front of the White Sox, who are at 500 at 63 and 63 in the West. You're seeing. One of the reasons Doyle Alexander is such an outstanding pitcher. He's thrown seven pitches this inning. Remember, he's pitching the 8, 9, and now the number one hitter. Law just got a base set. All seven pitches have been strikes. 
So he is saying, hey, guys, I'm going to get ahead of you if I can. If you want to put the ball in play, you're going to put it in play, maybe get a single. When he gets to the middle of the lineup, he gets a little finer. Little is one of baseball's best bunters, and he's established that reputation while playing the first couple of years of his career on artificial surface at Montreal, where it's tough to get one down. Remember during the strike, not this last strike, the one a few years ago, Sparky Anderson roamed the minor leagues, dared little to bunt after he bunted successfully twice against the Detroit farm team. Sparky said, I'll bet you can't do it tomorrow, first time up. Sparky had them tight at the corners, little dropped the bunt down, beat it out. And Sparky said, here's the five bucks on you, kid. He's in the middle of a lot of rallies since he's come back up. Doing that, he gets Mullix in a little bit tighter because he slaps the ball so well the opposite way. He's hitting the ball with more authority, pulling it occasionally and hitting it sharply to right field. He's a switch hitter, but they use him almost exclusively against right-handers. Well, last Saturday when Dave Steve had a no-hitter going in Comiskey Park, Chicago, went into the ninth, the first hitter up, Rudy Law hit a home run in the first pitch. Little was the next hitter. He had a home run off Steve. And Rudy Law is chased back. Little bought a videotape, Charlie Lau's videotape, on hitting and spent the entire winter going over it. Feels it's helped him significantly. 3-0. and You just might see a couple of little bitty batting practice fastballs, at least two right down the middle with Baines sitting on deck. Two outs, he wants Little to put this ball in play. Little was taking all the way for strike one. And maybe again. Witt looking in the dugout right now. Obviously, he's not going to call a pitch out. There's Jimmy Leyland to run, you know, to walk him. But uh, Law may be going on this pitch. He bluffed the go, and Little takes ball four. Alexander thought he got the corner with that one, as did Ernie Witt. Well, the umpire Chida yesterday, there were quite a few hitters and pitchers turned on the young umpires at third base today. It's getting that time of year. We're in the middle of the dog days of baseball. There's Shida getting the numbers of outs straight. Players get a little testier. They're coming out of, off the hot summer. Pennant races are shaping up. Baines hits the first pitch down to Upshaw. He'll have time. He takes it himself. So the White Sox threaten, but strand two, and we'll be right back. All right, Tony, let's take a look at the last play. Willie Upshaw kept the ball in front of him, and he was able to recover and get Baines. Well, this new turf they put in just before this season started is a lot bouncier than the slick burned out turf they had before this. Willie knew one thing, he had to keep the ball from going to the outfield to save a run, and he did. Ernie Witt starts it in the bottom of the third against Joel Davis. And Disa has a chance, an easy one at that. All right, let's find out once again what the Yankees and Angels are up to. Here's Bill McAtee. <laughs> And once again, Bill McAtee, up to those old pranks, refusing to appear on the air. I imagine we'll get back to him as soon as he overcomes his shyness. <laughs> so it's Barfield, down in the eighth spot in the order. Not your typical eighth hitter, 20 home runs. Good opposite field power, which helps him in this ballpark. There are times he won't go the opposite way enough. Tries to pull the outside pitch, which is not unusual for a young hitter. But Jesse's just 25. So he and Mosby and Bell are basically still learning to hit. I should exclude Bell. He knows how to hit. Learning how to adjust and readjust. Bell has just played so much more down in the Dominican Republic. He, Mosby, and Bell are all just 25. Born within a couple of weeks of each other. Late October, early November of 1959. Blue Jays are a young team. There's the defense with 
Ozzie Gijan playing slightly to pull for Barfield. Apparently they're going to try and keep the ball away because the center fielder is playing toward right center field, Salazar. Hope it's one of ours. Oh, the old jokes are the best, aren't they, Tony? <laughs> Here's Gijen from what would be the outfield grass to throw out Barfield. Six ground ball outs now thrown up by young Joel Davis. You can see that they wanted to keep the ball away, try and prevent Barfield from pulling the ball. And Ozzie is playing not as much to pull as a lot of teams play Barfield. So good pitching, good defensive alignment. Danny Evans, Len Rosenbaum, who set those charts, run them through a computer, position their defense. It's really helped Tony La Russa. Very important artificial surface. All right, here's another young shortstop, Tony Fernandez. And earlier this year, you said you thought this guy might be the best defensive shortstop in the American League. How do you compare him with Guijan? Better. He's got more range. A little more erratic. His throwing goes awry when he throws him down under. Fernandez has made more than twice as many errors as Guijan, but of course, that's not always the only measuring stick. Glider overhead as the air show continues. The Canadian National Exhibition goes on how long, Tony? About a month on the grounds surrounding the ballpark? 17 days. The Snowbirds, Canadian flying team. Is that how Canadian Anne Murray, she's from the eastern part of Canada, <laughs> the players. They're just more on that than they are the game. Anne Murray's song, Snowbirds, you think that's where it came from? Do you recall the words? I certainly do. Good. Don't sing them. Please. I shan't recite them. Greg Walker to start it in the fourth. That injured right shoulder also has hampered him at the plate. He's had difficulty going out and getting the outside pitch and hitting it with any kind of authority. There's some evidence. He has a good swing, to say the least. Saw him in Appleton in the Midwest League. Charlie Lau worked with him, now Mike Lum. You can see so many of the Charlie Lau trademarks in him. Kittle when he plays. Baines. Fisk. The bat touches the left shoulder. If you know when you stride that the bat is kept back. Weight on the back foot to start with. Fernandez back and in behind Mullenix. He makes the catch. Now let's find out if Bill McAtee is willing to join us. Bill? Bob, having completed the announcerless update, here it is again as the Yankees score two more in the bottom of the second. Don Mattingly brings home Bobby Meacham with this single. RBI number 105 for Mattingly. Ricky Henderson sacrificed the other run home. 3-0 Yankees. The catcher number 72, Carlton Fisk. All right, Bill, and speaking of the Yankees and the Angels, Angels broadcaster Bob Starr friend of mine uh, when we both worked at KMOX Radio in St. Louis suffered a heart attack yesterday and we certainly send our best wishes out to him. He is in a New York hospital and we hope he'll pull through all right. Want to know to Fisk. known for the deliberate way he catches a game and gets things straight before he steps in the box. He had a good pitch to hit, didn't he? Molinex makes the catch, wisely calling Witt off the play. Always a much easier play for the third baseman in that situation than yeah. it would be for the catcher. Not just because of the wind. Remember, that catcher doesn't have sunglasses on. It's a very bright day here. You can see Fist now. Or if it's tired or just a slump. When he gets a pitch like that, inside part of the plate, about belt high, Bat just a little slow coming through the uh, strike zone. Probably pulling that left shoulder out, trying to pull the ball too much. He's had one heck of a year, no matter what happens the rest of the way, though, hasn't he? Two out, nobody on, top of the fourth. No score, White Sox and Blue Jays. Oh, took geez. something off, and Disa had no chance. If you haven't listen to a ball game that we've done or somebody else when Doyle is pitched he throws what they call the circle change looks like a screwball at times Don Sutton throws one like that 
with the pointing finger and the thumb together, and it rolls off that last three fingers. The last contact point most times is the little finger. It gives a little screwball action. Well, yeah, Soto throws motion. that too, doesn't yeah. he, Mario Soto? So Soto's hands are so small. It isn't really a circle change. He can, he's got almost his whole hand on his fingertips. Or Soto throws a change of about 86, 7, 8 miles an hour. Faster than most guys' fastballs. There it is again. Two and two. Did you see where Soto knocked his countryman, Joaquin Andahar, down the other night? Not on purpose, however. <laughs> well, I don't know. It was a bunt situation, and Joaquin had squared, and Soto sent him a calling card. Another pop-up. Retreating is Garcia, and Garcia, rather, and Damaso will have it. A 1-2-3 inning for Alexander after three and a half in Toronto. Still no score. Throughout Davis's brief professional career, his problem has been control in the minors. From A ball all the way through Triple A, he averaged about five and a half walks per nine innings pitched. Not today, though, huh? Mm -mm. Damaso Garcia in the bottom of the fourth. Davis has retired all nine Blue Jays he's faced. This back for a look, but it's out of play. You know, sometimes the Blue Jays, uh, uh, not to pick them apart, but if you're looking for a flaw in their offense, they've got a lot of guys that don't like to take base on balls. Garcia's won. He's only walked, what, 11 times this year? George Bell walking more than they thought he would. He's up in the 30s. Garth Orgen, he plays, doesn't walk a whole lot. That's what he's done in 530 plate appearances, 11 times. So you would say he's not an ideal leadoff hitter. When he's hot, he's a darn good leadoff hitter. When he's in a little bit of a slump, you maybe want to put something else there. The two guys they have at the top of the order, Garcia and Mosby, are stolen base threats. Damaso has swiped 27, and Lloyd leads the team with 31 steals. And you can't go to sleep on your mound with Bell or Barfield are on base either, or Fernandez. Overall, team speed is excellent. Garcia didn't like that pitch. One and two is the count to him. Again, we remind our viewers, we'll select the NBC Light Beer from Miller player of the game appropriately at the conclusion of the contest. It's always tougher before the game starts. It certainly is. The one-two. This might be the Blue Jays' first hit. Guijen can't get back in time. Now they've got the perfect situation. Bobby Cox, you mentioned earlier, his team leads the American League in stolen bases. There's Billy Smith alerting Damaso Garcia. How many outs? He's the first base coach. Got a left-handed hitter up. A young pitcher. Garcia's speed. If his knee's all right, we could see some movement on the bases. Fisk has been throwing exceptionally this year. He did not just build up strength under Dr. Phil Clausen. His flexibility, his footwork, his agility have really picked up this year, too. be fouled out to Fisk his first time up not going on the first pitch fouled off Mosby started off the season in the three spot against both left and right handed pitchers he is not hit for average he is will take a base on balls even though he's left-handed, this may not be the ideal spot for him with a man on base because he doesn't turn on the ball and doesn't have really a lot of ability to pull it through the hole. As long as they keep throwing him hard stuff. Might have broken his bat. Hop into shallow center. Guijan waves everybody Salazar out. Salazar couldn't the find catch. it. Salazar couldn't find the ball in center field. That's that screen in a bright sunny day causes defensive outfielders from opposing teams more difficulty than the home team. I don't think he saw. That's why Jen had to hurry so. Casey Stengel used as his trademark for shortstops. Not always how far he could go into the hole and throw a guy out. How far he could go out for a pop-up, which enabled him, especially in Yankee Stadium, to play his outfield deeper to cut down the long ball in the gaps. Putting modesty aside, could you go back on a pop? Compared to who? Well, compared to whoever else Casey might have played at shortstop, I mean, he must have thought you did it all right. I think so. He played you. Yeah. All modesty aside, I'm not sure. 
<laughs> Mullinex. <laughs> A drive to center, and Salazar gets back on it. The second out. So now the Blue Jays are coming through the lineup for the second time. Garcia, and they know what the movement on Davis ball is. You can ask somebody else to go for scouting report to say how hard does he throw, but he can't tell you the delivery. Because he's sneaky fast, he can say he throws 87, 88, whatever you want. But how much does his ball move? What does it do? Until you see a guy and see all his pitches, you're not sure. Now the Blue Jays have seen him one time through. Those three home runs for Bell against the White Sox this year have all been memorable. Two over the left field roof at Comiskey Park. The third into the center field bleachers there. Strike one. In a short four-game series that ended last week. One in the center field, only seven hitters in the history of Comiskey Park have ever hit him there. That is like, I think, Ger uh, not Gary, or Greenberg, Tony Armiston last year. Jimmy Fox. Fox. Dick Allen. I mean, there's some sluggers. I'll show you how strong this guy is. All the home plate now. Last couple of years has moved closer in Kaniski Park. Here's the 0-1 pitch. On the corner 0-2. Yeah, but he hit it over the old barrier. Not only cleared the interior fence, but over the old wall and into the bleachers. That's got to be about 450. Garcia opened the inning with a bloop single. He's still at first with two out and the count 0-2 to Bell. One and two. Garcia is on his own. He thinks he can get a pitch usually. Now Bobby Cox with Bell up. The cleanup hitter may have the stop sign. There's Jimmy Williams giving the sign. There was a time Garcia might have been going early in this inning with Mosby or Mullix up two left-handed hitters. Apparently the knees still bother him, lower backs bothered him on occasion. He missed some games on the last road trip. He's moved to the number three spot in the lineup because his running speed was gone a little bit. Over the back. Back goes Guijen. There's no question about his ability to go back on a pop-up. The Blue Jays get their first hit, but Garcia is left at first base. Four complete, no score. Back after this from your local station. of the order to face Alexander in the fifth. Fletcher, Guijan, and Salazar are due. The Sox have two hits against Alexander. Singles by Rudy Law and Carlton Fisk. A single by Damaso Garcia, the only safety against Joel Davis for Toronto. Interesting to say, see before the midnight you know, roster setting deadline, whatever you call it for postseason play, if there are going to be any more deals. Toronto's been looking at Steve Nicosia, a veteran catcher, with Buck Martinez out for the year with that fractured leg. Rumors the Yankees may be looking at Moose Haas or Ray Burst from the Brewers or Mike Krukow out from the San Francisco Giants to bolster their pitching staff into September. They'll be calling some kids up. The White Sox are going to call three or four guys up after the September 1st date. Joel Skinner, Daryl Boston, who started in center field for them, a couple of others. That's a fair ball, and Fletcher might have extra bases. Barfield gets over there in a hurry and fires that bullet to Fernandez at second base. They used to use Daryl Evans, Dwight Evans of the White Sox, as the standard for throwing arms among right fielders. Gradually, it may be changing to Barfield. Not only does he make a good throw, but Fletcher thought he had double all the way as he broke out of the box, and Barfield goes into foul territory. You save a double, keep a guy to scoring position, it could change the course of the ball game. It's this close. Mullenix expecting the bunt. Kijen didn't show it on the first pitch. Jim Leyland with the signs from the third base coaching box. Joe Nosick is the coach at first. Barfield coming in and toward the line, and Jesse has it. Now, one thing, since Barfield's been playing every day, the first time this year against right and left-handed pitchers, he's more confident not only at the bat, but he certainly has gained more confidence defensively. The center fielder, number five, Louis Salazar. 
He's played some center field and Mosby goes down. Salazar swinging a hot bat of late. 231 overall for the season. Occasional power, seven home runs. Got a hit and run. Not yet. That's one is called. To, but it sure looks like it, although they've tried to get jumps on Doyle Alexander. Rudy Law in the third with two outs. Alexander changes pitching pattern, so there's Tony La Russa, who's a very aggressive manager. Not only has Alexander been throwing over, he's changing his rhythm. He's stepped off. He never shows the base runner the same thing twice. Speeding up his cadence and his delivery to home plate. Right through the wickets. In between Alexander's legs and on his way to third is Fletcher. He'll be there. Runners at the corners with one out. Comes from the side and runs a fastball in on the fist. I don't think it was hit as hard as Doyle thought. He reached for it. It was a little bit up on the trademark off the bat of Salazar, and he reached for it. It wasn't there yet. So now it'll be Rudy Law with a chance to break the ice. He's grounded out and single. Fletcher at third, Salazar at first. Salazar has 12 stolen bases, been caught three times. Mullix creeps in at third base. Fouled off for strike one. Of course, Law would be a tough man to double, although if he hits the ball sharply on this artificial surface, he can turn it on just about anybody. Looking for a pitch he can drive to the outfield, get in the least a sacrifice fly. Gets He'll get more than that. It's one nothing White Sox. Salazar will stop respecting Barfield's arm, and wisely so. Nice piece of hitting by Rudy Law. He was trying to get the ball to the right side so he could create a first and third if possible. He hits it through the hole with Upshaw. Holding the runner on first base. And another tribute to Jesse Barfield's arm as the ball gets by Upshaw. Having to hold up to let the ball get by. Salazar couldn't go to third, but also Jesse Barfield's arms out there. So now Brian Little, who's flied out and walked. And the cheers will start shortly at Yankee Stadium when they throw this score up on the board. White Sox with the early lead. Meanwhile, the Yanks lead the Angels 3-0. Adamas Garcia is playing a very shallow second base. Little doesn't have outstanding running speed. In fact, he's an average runner. One of the reasons he couldn't play shortstop on the turf in Montreal. Look where Garcia is. On this turf, you play that shallow, balls can get by you in a hurry. Tony La Russa hasn't given up yet on the American League West race. He's nine back. They do have six left with California. Well, that means nothing if they don't play better. Well, yesterday, Toronto's victory broke a five-game winning streak for La Russa's White Sox. Since the All-Star break, California, Oakland, and the White Sox have all played around 500. Kansas City has been the hot team. They've made up ground. Although the Royals did lose last night to drop two and a half back. Three and one. There are the standings in the West. California still trails the Yankees now in the fourth inning. Three nothing. At Yankee Stadium. Ed Whitson just gave up his first base hit. Fernandez, one, oh. play up Shaw, and into the dugout, run and a score. run will score. Rudy Law put an awful lot of pressure on Tony Fernandez. He had an outstanding jump off first base. Runners on first and second. A good walking lead.
Tony still should have made the play, but look how close Rudy Law gets to him to make him throw from down under. You know what? That's really funny. Upshaw didn't really get on the bag and stretch. They're going to give this air to Fernandez, which they should, but he got his feet crossed up. Look at that. If he's on the bag and stretches, he's got that ball to fly. He got his feet caught on the bag and got all tangled up and a rattle scar because of it. That air is going to go to Fernandez, but that could very easily have gone to Willie Upshaw. He, got, he was late getting there for some reason. Get tangled up. And instead of being out of the inning with just one run scoring, Alexander now trails 2-0. Look at that ball hits just about a foot in front of the first base bag, and he didn't even stretch on it. He got all tangled up for some reason. That hasn't happened to him. Oh, and two to Harold Baines. He's become a pretty good guy at scooping balls out of the dirt. Not that time. Dennis Lamb begins to throw. He's been brilliant in long or middle relief for the Blue Jays. One and two. The error charged to Fernandez Boy, is his 24th you. of the season. Only Julio Franco of the Cleveland Indians has made more errors among American League shortstops. It's one of those of official Roy LaFay sees the replays of. He could change that. That ball was very catchable by Upshaw. The 2-2 two -two pitch. Change up and he struck him out. But not before. The White Sox break through with two runs, one of them unearned, and they lead 2-0 after four and a half. These surroundings have been good to Al Oliver, the designated hitter who leads it off in the bottom of the fifth. He hadn't homered in about two years, and he's connected for five since joining the Blue Jays about a month or so ago. Something like 175 consecutive ball games. The DH spot at Al's age is made for him. They've got a pretty good platoon tandem now. He and Cliff Johnson, and of course Jeff Burroughs was doing that job from the right side. There's He's a, a good uh, pinch hitter now. There's Johnson. See the guy in the glasses? He's been awesome. Tom Hankey finally scored a run on him. Short relief. And the 2-0 pitch to Oliver. Disa on the short hop. Davis covers, and they've got it. There's an irony here because a few years ago, when Burroughs arrived in Oakland, he displaced Cliff Johnson as the A's designated hitter, and Johnson came over to the Blue Jays. Now, after a trip to Texas, Johnson has returned, and Burroughs apparently is relegated to pinch hitting duties as Johnson will become the right-handed half of Bobby Cox's DH platoon. And there is Burroughs. Henke was in between Burroughs and Johnson on the Blue Jays bench. Well, I think a big thing Pat Gillick wanted to do, and Bobby Cox, too, and his scouting staff, Bobby Maddock, Al Lamaki, they wanted to go into September with a little more experience off the bench. Before Tom Filer went down in Minnesota last week, they had seven rookies. Uh, well, Filer wasn't exactly a rookie, nor is Hanky, but close to being rookies. A lot of guys have never been through pennant races. The Yankees have had a lot of that experience. But you take the 25 best quality guys you've got in your organization that you can get at the time, and you go with them. That's what Gillick's done. 2-0 pitch to Upshaw. Line drive, base hit. Just the second hit off Davis. Back on June 27th, Willie Upshaw was hitting 217. Still not hitting quite with the power they like. B.J. Birdie. One of your favorites, I know. Oh, he's a wonderful person. Not a person. He's an animal. He's a bird. I like the person. I don't like the bird. He's got this cartoon strip now, the bird, that he can get back at you with the newspaper. Whittle have to hit anything into a strong wind blowing across now. Off Joel Davis. Changes the game in this ballpark with his fall wind. Tying run at the plate. He's hit 15 homers. Now I noticed that uh, B.J. Bird took a shot at you in his cartoon strip after you had been critical of the bird over the air. Next to 
Blue Jay Vice President Paul Beeston, I'm his second favorite person. Or is it unfavorite? Well, the Angels jump back into it, trailing now only 3-2 as they score twice against Whitson in the fourth. Interesting now, uh, Davis hasn't had a whole lot of chance to pitch with men on base, pitch from the stretch. Let's see if his control can stay what it was when he was pitching from the full windup. 3-0. and well, Sometimes that can be a problem. We don't have in-depth stats at this point to see what is control problems were in the minor leagues Buffalo this year earlier this year perhaps he has difficulty with a man on base either mechanically his attention divided the second man that's been on base off in this ball game gets it over for the first strike Barfield is on deck not unusual even two runs down with a three and one count that Bobby Cox may start Upshaw create a hole. Wood hits the ball hard on the ground. They're playing the pull. Might stay out of a double play. He doesn't strike out a whole lot. He is going on the 3-1 pitch, and Witt taps it foul. White Sox have three important games coming up early next week. Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday at Kansas City. The last three cracks they have at the Royals. And when all is said and done, it's possible that everybody will wind up chasing Kansas City in the American League West. The White Sox, as we told you, have six left with California. So they've got to do something. And it's got to be something big in those head-to-head -head meetings to keep whatever faint hopes they have alive. And those hopes are realistically well, very, just, very yeah. faint. Not just head to head, they just got to win every series, and even that may not do it. They've got to put together a bunch of winning streaks, what they got to do. Yeah, three teams to climb over. It's not yep. just uh, the Royals and the Angels. Oakland's in there, too. Desa's moved behind Upshot first now. He'd probably be going again. Payoff pitch, and he is going. Foul ball. Think about Bobby Cox. He got quite a bit of Earl Weaver's philosophy. He likes the big inning, doesn't bunt very often. In fact, the lowest total in the major league, just 15 sacrifice hits by Bobby Cox, as opposed to Gene Rock. The fellow that Cox has left, Cecil Fielder. Cox's Blue Jays have made life difficult. There's a strong young man right there, jumped right over Syracuse from double-A ball, Cecil Fielder, been platooning at first with Upshaw. Difficult for Tony La Russa and his White Sox. Toronto has beaten them 8 of 10. Runner going again. Called strike three. It looked and like a changeup. goes into up. second base with the steal. 3-2 changeup. That fist couldn't get out of the glove. Let's go to New York now for an update. All right, Bob, there has been a significant trade this afternoon. The Dodgers, unsettled at third, have acquired four-time batting champion Bill Madlock from the Pirates. The Pirates, in financial trouble, rid themselves of Madlock's contract and acquire three players to be named later. Back to Toronto. So another of those deals we've been talking about. Cedeno to the Cardinals. Cliff Johnson back here to the Blue Jays. And perhaps most significantly of all, because he's likely to play every day down the stretch, Madlock to the Dodgers. And in case you haven't been checking the box scores, Madlock has begun to hit well for the Pirates the last two or three weeks. A few old runs there over the short stretch. A weak wave starts now. And also another buzzing of the planes overhead. Blue Jays gave up two minor league prospects to this point to get Cliff Johnson back. Matt Williams, a right-handed pitcher, another kid named Mays from Medicine Hat. One more player to be named later, probably after they're out of all playoff competition in the minor leagues. So Cliff Johnson can tell his grandchildren he was traded for Mays and Williams. rivals your Mason Dixon line of last week. Not quite. Of course, we will not rehash the old material. <laughs> Must move on to new items. 
0 and 1 to Barfield. Upshaw at second. Two out, bottom of the fifth. Two nothing White Sox. 0 and 2. Not too many teams can throw your eighth place hitter. You mentioned 20 home runs with 67 RBIs. Barfield with 54 walks. That's what happens to him when a right handed pitcher faces the Blue Jays, moves up in the lineup against left handers. He appears distracted at the plate by the combination of the wave and the planes overhead affecting his concentration. He stepped out of the box a couple of times. Held up and it's outside. May have been a setup pitch, a slider that went away from Barfield. Let's see if Fist stays out there and now tries to bust him in on the fence. And center field camera will tell you. A lot of sign switching with Upshaw at second. Let's see if we can pick up location. Looking up at Barfield, a decline. He's moving back away. A liner for a base hit. This will bring them a run closer. Trying for two, oh, and he's no. there. Ball was cut off, and Barfield might have had trouble. Asik Ejen with a crowd yelling very loudly. Cut the ball off. Brian Little probably tried to yell above the crowd and couldn't to let the ball come. Barfield hustles out a double. Look at how much time Rudy Law takes. And with Guijan cutting it off, it allowed Barfield to get in the scoring position. Two mistakes. Rudy Law nonchalanting it in the outfield and Guijan cutting it off. Considering the way Law threw it, though, and where it bounced, even if Guijan had let it go through, Barfield probably would have been safe. His law didn't have much, much mustard on that throw. Barfield looked like he had a pretty good pitch to a slider that was at least away. Don't know how far down it was. It was low in the strike zone. He went out and got a pretty good pitch to drive home a run. The hustling play puts Barfield in scoring position. A single now could tie the game. And Fernandez produces that base hit. Here comes Barfield. Even up at two. Little got a glove on it, but couldn't keep it in the infield. Pretty good RBI production by your double play combination. Fernandez now with RBI 45. He's at ninth a good part of this year. Lead off at times with Garcia. His knee was hurt. Garcia's got 54 runs batted in. Out comes Tony La Russa, punch Fist to talk to Davis. Big stolen base by Upshaw when the ball popped out of Fist's glove. Kept things going. La Russa told us before the game that one of the things he likes about the 20-year-old Joel Davis is his composure on the mound. Part of the reason for this trip is to make sure he maintains that composure. This inning has not gone well for him. But he appears to still have his good stuff, and Larusa is telling him that. Get us out of this inning. 2-2 ball game. We'll be all right. We got you the two in the top half, so if you get out of it here, you'll be no worse off than you were an inning ago. When you look at the offensive production that Sparky Anderson got last year, here's Tony Fernandez. Between Fernandez and Garcia now, they have 99 RBIs. Remember last year, Whitaker and Trammell. Not only producing defensively, offensively, they were so good. Whitaker still is. Trammell struggling a little bit. Bobby Meacham, first home run, 4-2. Yankees over the Angels in the fourth. Alfredo Griffin and Donnie Hill from Oakland have more RBIs between them than Trammell and Whitaker. It's another surprise. Garcia swings on the first one. Hits it off. deep left, and Rudy Law gets back and makes the catch against the padding after turning the wrong way. So a sigh of relief from Joel Davis. The Blue Jays come back to tie it. Here's another edition of baseball. Damaso Garcia got a low breaking ball. When the ball's down in the strike zone, he drives the ball a lot harder than when it's up. Rudy Law may have lost the ball just momentarily off the glare. Turned the wrong way, recovers, makes a nice, nice catch. And he makes the fine play, ironically, against the emblem of the Detroit Tigers, a team we were talking about a moment ago. Who would have thought that the Tigers this year would become one of the American League's worst 
defensive teams. Well, Sparky read them out a couple of days ago, I understand. And said, you're not going to quit on me now, guys. They've had some injuries. I mean, he did make the statement, they're the worst defensive team he's ever seen. Which I think he is dealing in a little hyperbola. Sparky has a tendency to do that at times. Notice how the trap door has opened on division winners in the AL East the year after. Let's take another look at it. Precipitous declines. In the last three years, there have been 12 different division winners. 2-0 to Walker. Opening up in the sixth. Despite the shoulder injury, Walker is the only White Sox player to appear in every game in 1985. Wax this one into center, and Mosby comes on and takes it. The one thing that even though Lloyd has struggled with the bat more often than not this season, he's not quit defensively around the bases. He's been a little bit of an inspiration to this ball club in that regard. Went through those first three years where he struggled with the bat, the learning process at the major league level, coming off two good years. Uh, huh. What do you have for us here, Robert? Well, at age 37, if Fisk holds his American League home run lead, he'll become the oldest ever to lead the American League in that category. Ruth tied Gary for the honors in 1931. In the National League, Cy Williams was 40 when he won a home run crown. So that will remain the overall major league record. Cy Williams hit 30 for the Philadelphia Phillies in 1927 to lead in the National League, which was exactly half of Babe Ruth's total that season to lead the American on one pitch. One and two on the fastball. Fisk has just one home run since August 14th. And I think rather than him admitting to the fact that he might be a little bit tired with age and all those games going up and down this year and past years, he'd probably tell you that mechanics have been upset trying to pull the ball too much like that. You know, that name Cy Williams is an interesting one. I had a chance to meet him from Three Lakes, Wisconsin. You probably knew this. If you didn't, the first Williams shift was not Lou Boudreau against Ted Williams. It was against Cy Williams. Died several years back. Change up that ran in a little bit below the bell off his foot. You sure they didn't use it against Ken Williams of the St. Louis Browns in the 20s? Nope. This is Cy Williams. Definitely. He told me that. Three right. guys in the infield on the right side of the diamond. Popped up. Garcia and Upshaw. And it's Damaso Garcia. Two quick outs in the top of the sixth. And that brings up Disa, who's 0 for 2. So Fisk's batting average. He doesn't like what he sees from that bat. The way he grabbed it looked like that bat was going to be demolished. <laughs> looked almost like before he got to the, not the dugout, it's a field level. He's going to get rid of that one in the back room. Fisk's batting average well beneath his career standard. He's been a 275, 280 hitter pretty consistently. So while he's having his best year in homers, he's well beneath his usual performance batting average wise. A strike to Disa. Last time up, he turned Joe Disa in knots with some change ups away. Now he runs a fastball away. This kind of situation where he may come in and cut that fastball and break his bat right there. Alexander, most of last year, was a two-pitch pitcher. Fastball and the changeup. Throwing a few more sliders this year. Threw some knuckleballs this year, as he did last. Like he just put the knuckleball grip at maybe just the decoy Disa. See him with the knuckles, put it in the glove, and he went fastball. Decoy. Lofted it to left. George Bell glides over. And a 1-2-3 inning for Alexander. After five and a half, the White Sox, two. And the Blue Jays, too. Coming up after baseball, we go to the mat on Sports World, the Sumo Grand Tournament. You got to look at some of those fellas. You'll think twice about that second slice of pie. And that'll be followed by a tongue-in-cheek look at the world of professional wrestling. Is the Hulk in there? Hulk Hogan? Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. 
Mr. Fuji, the magnificent Morocco. What happened to the Swedish Angel and Vern Gagne? I know his son is wrestling now. Not to mention classy ones. Freddie Blassie, the Hollywood fashion plate. Strike one to Mosby, leading off in the bottom half of the sixth inning. Got a good ball game going. Joel Davis struggled a little bit when he got a man on base. Seemed to lose a little bit of, of his concentration mechanically anyway, pitching from the stretch. He's still very young, just 20. Is Rio the only pitcher younger in the American League? Jose Rio? Former Yankee now with Oakland. It's Manny Lee sitting on the Blue Jays bench, just 20 this season. Didn't Mosby try and drop that bunt in unusual fashion? He didn't run up on the ball as if to drag it. He squared like you would to sacrifice. Well, I think what happened is he had Scotty Fletcher, the third baseman, so far back, not even looking for a bunt. Mosby rarely does this. Lloyd probably figured if I can just get it down as deeply as he was playing him, I could almost walk into first base. 0-2 pitch. Off-speed delivery high. Mosby, Mullenix, and Bell in the sixth. 4-4. Four, four. Boy, is Rupert Jones, who just hit a home run. And is he having a good year for Gene Mox Angels? That's wow. number 20 for him to tie it up. Remember, he was with Detroit last year and played well coming off the bench. Davis gets Mosby looking. Two consecutive breaking balls up in the strike zone. He got a head 0-2 to Mosby. He ran a slider too high, and then he gets away with one high in the strike zone here. Look at Fess kind of frame the outside part of the plate, press the ball back into the strike zone. It was a hanging pitch that he got away with. So the skies have brightened for the Blue Jays. A few moments ago, they were trailing here 2-0 while the Yankees led the Angels 3-0. Both games are tied now. 2-2 at Toronto, 4-4 at Yankee Stadium. Candelaria beat Bystrom as the Angels prevailed over the Yanks last night. Of course, the Angels are not thinking of this in terms of helping the Blue Jays. They're concerned with their own race, which they lead by 2.5 over Kansas City in the West. Mullick's usually one of the steadiest of Blue Jays hitters last year and most of this year. He's in a 5 for 47 slump. Well, he breaks out of it with that hit. I think it's 6 for 48 now. He doesn't usually go this long without a lot of base sets. Remember, he was up over 320 for the season last year. Got a hanging breaking ball. I would think if Dave Duncan and uh, Tony La Russa are watching off the bench, they've seen some breaking balls high in the strike zone this inning and starting last inning. Open still quiet, though. Well, sooner or later, a young pitcher's got to learn to pitch out of problems and through adversity. And Bobby Maddock, when he managed the Blue Jays, did that for Clancy, Steve, Leal. That, perhaps that's what Larusa's going to do with Davis. Bell hasn't made solid contact yet. Grounded to first and popped to short. You know, in a normal year, Bell might be the favorite to win the MVP award with his team possibly on the way to a division championship. But you've got to look at what Brett is doing in Kansas City, what Henderson and Mattingly are doing with the Yankees. So Bell has just an outside shot. It's going to be interesting in the National League. The Cardinals have so many candidates and the Dodgers have really only one in Pedro Guerrero. And so if some Cardinals split the vote, Guerrero might walk off with it. What did Whitey Herzog say, though? He said there's only one MVP in the National League, and it's Dr. K, Dwight Gooden. A one pitch. One and one. My feeling, and obviously not all the voters share it, is that you only vote for a pitcher for MVP if there is no outstanding everyday player as a candidate. The pitchers or, have their award. That's the Cy Young Award. Or one other consideration that I think good meets this year. If you are so overpowering and dominating that you ought to be considered strongly. I'm not saying you should get it because September's still to come. Into right center field. Baines will get over there. And Mullenix has to return to first. Talking about the Koufax kind of year, the Vita Blue kind of year with Oakland. Or one other consideration, there are those who reason that a relief pitcher having a great year is almost like an everyday player. Willie Hernandez won both awards last year for the Tigers. Let's pause briefly for station identification on the NBC television network. 
This is WOC-TV in Davenport, the sports leader in the Quad Cities. Bottom half of the sixth. White Sox and Blue Jays tied at two apiece. Oliver at the plate, Mullenix at first with two out. Swing and a miss. Al Oliver is another of those to note that you see many more breaking balls in the American League, and you'll see that breaking pitch on 2-0 and 3-1 and and far more frequently than you will in the National League. Down to second baseman Brian Little. That takes care of Oliver and retires the side of the sixth. We'll be right back after these messages from your local station. Alexander right in the background. All right, Tony. <laughs> Let's Did see I... if you can name those five pitchers who have beaten each of the 26 Major League teams at least once. Well, you know that I just blew the cover of one of them because it's Doyle Alexander. The other four are a little trickier. And who is the other active pitcher? We'll start with that. Just Not... recently joined that group with a victory about two weeks ago. It's not Tom Seaver because he has not yet beaten the White Sox. And that's going to be almost impossible, I would think. Mm -hmm. Nor is it Tommy John, who never beat the Dodgers. A couple of weeks ago, when Don Sutton beat Milwaukee for the Oakland A's, he joined that group. He has defeated all 26 Major League teams. And the other three, Rick Wise, Gaylord Perry, and Mike Torres. Fletcher fouls one down the right field line and just into the seats. Can't give up on a ball too quickly out in that right field corner if it's high in the air because the wind is blowing it back to make it playable. There's the exhibition grounds in the background. The mode of transportation. Fletcher is struck out and singled. 0-2. Oh when Alexander comes down three quarters and then puts it right on the black on the outside corner, those right-handed hitters are helpless. That one missed. That pitch right there may be a setup pitch. It was more over the top than three quarters. He throws that changeup not only from over the top, but when he throws it from the side, it is such an effective pitch. I can't think of any other pitcher that throws it. There it was. Change up from down at the side. You don't nice pick up play. the ball. You don't pick up the ball right away when he changes delivery, and your immediate thing is to try and look for a fastball and swing at it. And he does that once in a while. When he comes from change up, he just really goofs up your timing. Right. Ridley signed with the Dodgers, Don Alexander. Another there change was the up. change, and he gloves the little squibber from Fletcher and throws him out. Let's go to Bill McAtee in New York. All right, Robert, you mentioned the score. Rupert Jones, who had a home run last night, has another today. This two-run shot in the fifth into the upper deck and right is 20th of the year. Whitson is now gone, so, Bob, the Angels have come back again. They're tied at four. All right, Bill, thanks very much. You know, everybody's pointing toward those three season-ending games between the Yankees and Blue Jays here at Exhibition Stadium assuming the race is still close at that time. But the Blue Jays might have to play an additional game. It's possible, if it has a bearing on the division race, that they would play Baltimore here on the Monday after the scheduled conclusion to the regular season in a makeup game. A game lost to the strike, but they'll play it only if it counts in the standings. Well, if you're looking for edges, and they're always difficult to find in September, we've talked about the home schedules. Both the Yankees and Blue Jays have a lot of games at home. That's advantageous, I guess. Baltimore's starting to play a little bit better with Boddicker pitching better. And McGregor looks like he's getting on the beam. Storm Davis with a shutout yesterday. It will mean that Baltimore will be beating the heck out of some of these teams, too. So that might be an advantage to the Blue Jays with the lead they have right now. The Yankees not only can come in and say, we'll beat them five out of seven or sweep the seven Baltimore could give them trouble but another edge might be that the Blue Jays have I think five off days where the Yankees have just one remaining in September and that means you can go to four-man pitching staff and even a three-man starting staff 
you know, in September, if you have to with the off days, the Yankees can't do that. You're going to get their four and five starters, their weaker starters. Barfield can't get it, and it caroms off of him. Gijet heads for second. Quick recovery by wow. Barfield, and he almost got it. He made that close, didn't he? What base running by Ozzie Gijet? He cut first base so sharply, he's looking at Barfield now, saying, how could you even make it that close, pal? Boy, Barfield he smothers in a hurry. Him. It was a tough ball to smother on this quick, springy turf. He pounces on it barehand, and he throws a bullet to Tony Fernandez and almost gets Ozzie Gijen. If Gijen doesn't run hard all the way from home plate to first, he's gone. So a one-out double for Gijen. And it brings up Salazar, who's one for two. That is very aggressive outfield play because if that ball gets by Barfield, it's an inside to Parker for sure. He knew he had to smother it, keep it in front of him, and he did. 1-0. Toronto's bullpen gets up now. Dropping down to the side and missing high, 2-0. Each team scored twice in the fifth, and that's where we stand. Dennis Lamp, the right-hander. Gary Laval, the left-hander. Three and oh. Lead-off man Rudy Law will be next. Taking all the way, and it's in there. Quickly, folks, this telecast is presented by authority of Major League Baseball. May not be reproduced or retransmitted in any form without the express written consent of Major League Baseball. Hit well, but foul. Full count now to Salazar. Alexander dropped down, got a ball up and in, but it was far enough inside off the plate when it tailed in. And if Salazar had tried to steer it fair, he would have gotten himself out. He would have jammed himself. He had to pull it foul. Good pitch by Alexander. And the payoff. Reached for it, and a base hit to right. They're going to stop hold. him. Gijen almost ran ah. through the stop sign. Now the throw to second. Safe there. Came off the ball. Well, what didn't happen on this play? Gijen almost ran through Leyland's stop sign. Then he held up. Salazar tried to advance to second. He was originally safe, came off the bag, and they tagged him out. Leyland was sending him on. He went up the line, and then he held him at the last. Barfield makes a mistake, missing the cutoff man. Gets away with it for only one reason. Maybe two. First, whip, gun the throw down to second base. And then Salazar, sliding hard, goes past the bag. And Fernandez keeps the tag on him, so Alexander could be at a heck of a lot of trouble right now. Two outs. He doesn't overslide the bag. You got second and third. Infield comes in, and you got a sacrifice fly breaks the tie. How it changed. He Janet third now with two out. 0 and 1 to Rudy Law. They want him to check at third. He didn't go around. Mullix is way up tight at third. There's Tim Scheida, the third base umpire, with a safe sign. Mullix looking for a possible bunt to score this run off Rudy Law. Look where he's playing. Boy, is there a lot of territory to hit by down that left field, left side, isn't there? Playing this shallow. Two and one. Witt held it there again, hoping for the call from Rocky Rowe. You won't see Alexander argue balls and strikes too often. He's one of those veteran pitchers like Carlton, Seaver. I figure a guy misses him. Let's go on to the next one. They put it out of their mind. And that one got the corner. Two and two. Well, you don't argue a lot, which Alexander doesn't. Sometimes you get the next call. That was a close pitch. Could have gone either way. Slaps a breaking ball foul. Rudy Law, as he stands at the plate, is two for three on the day and drove in their first run with a single in the fifth. That one will also 
also be out of play. Interesting when you start talking about pennant races and not that September 1st is the automatic day to start pennant races, but everything seems to get magnified when you get to this time of the year. The ball game that could be won or lost by oversliding the bag, which could make a difference in September in the Eastern Division. Don't know if that play is going to hold up. It would have been a heck of a lot more trouble for Alexander and the Blue Jays. He pops it off. Fernandez will take it, and Alexander wriggles off the hook. We go to the bottom of the seventh. Still tied at two, and here's another edition of seventh inning stretch. A picture of relaxation. Tom Seaver, the subject of our seventh inning stretch feature. That's like having a second pitching coach on your staff, isn't it? Just watching Seaver work over hitters. And Tom still 10 a dozen times a ball game gets the ball up there about 90 miles an hour. Still, he always preaches mechanics. I'm talking about Charlie Lau or Ted Williams' books on hitting. You've got to include Seaver's book on pitching. A number of books. At Yankee Stadium, Mike Pagliarulo just hit his 17th homer of the year for wow. New York. And in the sixth, they jump back in front of the Angels 7-4. Looking at some of those pitchers for the White Sox a while ago, it's kind of nice to see Rich Dotson back and throwing the ball on the side lightly. He's had some major surgery, area of his right shoulder in the chest area. Upshaw to start it. He led off their two-run fifth with a single and stole a base in that inning. One and one. Two runs, seven hits, no errors for the White Sox. Two, five, and one for the Jays. Good pitch from Davis. He does a little cut fastball, or if it was a slider, it's up in the strike zone. It just kept boring in and Upshaw. You know, if you just said, let's look at Upshaw again. Fist sets up outside something off a breaking ball. It was like a slurve down and in. Upshaw swung over it by a foot. Great the one-two. There's the got him. Almost looks like a palm ball, that changeup. You know, when you just said, if you'd said in spring training that Upshaw and Mosby would have, I mean, they were the heart of the line at three and four in the Scottish spring training, have 23 home runs between them and just over 100 RBIs between them, you just said there's no way the Blue Jays could be in contention now, and yet they've got a five-game lead going into the Witz 0 for 2. The strikeout of Upshaw was just the third for Davis. Foul right back wow. at us. Earlier this year, when Cito Gaston, the hitting instructor, spread Witt's legs apart, opened up his stance, and got him hit more with his hands, he started driving the ball a lot better. Look at how wide he is. The 0-1 pitch. Change is high. One out, nobody on. One and one the count. Bottom of the seventh, tied at two. Hit hard, but Disa's there. He'll take it himself for the second out. Field, and he was the key man in the two-run fifth inning. He got a two-out hit to drive in the first run, and it should have been a single. He stretched it into a double, and from there he scored on Fernandez's single, which followed immediately. Not only two outs, it was one ball, two strikes, as I remember the count, and he took a slider low and away that he hit the left center. He'll be looking inside at least for one or maybe two pitches to turn on the ball, get it in the wind. Didn't get it inside. See so how he pulled off the ball to try and get it in that wind blowing out to left field. Something Cito Gaston has really tried to pump into the heads of the younger hitters like Mosby, Barfield, Upshaw. Hitting situations. We need a home run. Take a couple cracks at it. There's Clarence Gaston. Pretty good hitter and defensive center fielder from San Diego and Atlanta. That's an understatement. Pretty good. He had some good years for him. A couple. 
Barfield behind on the count 0 and 2. Fletcher at third right on the line. Seventh inning to take a double away. Still 0 and 2. Now the situation, the defense changes when you get in the last three, sometimes four inning of the ball game. Fletcher's right on the line, guarding against the double. The outfield has moved almost back to the warning track. You don't want a gapper now to get in scoring position or a ball hit over your head. So, Tony LaRussa, who uses the computers like Davey Johnson, putting him to good work. Especially important on artificial surface where that ball just scoots through in such a big hurry. Holes at 0 and 2. He looks like he's got pretty good movement on his fastball, doesn't he? Not only is he sneaky fast, Joel Davis he cuts the fastball. He's run some in on the fist, and the times early in the ball game looked like his fastball was sinking. He was getting a few more ground balls than he has the last few innings. It's right at 80 pitches now. Breaking ball is high. You know, you were talking about as we get into the heat of a pennant race, individual plays or games that loom larger and will be remembered by those that win and those that fall just short at season's end. There are so many plays and games that fit that description. Hit up the middle. Guijan is there. From behind second base, he throws, and that takes care of Barfield. Well, we won't have time to review all those plays, will we? But we will when we come back. Whoopee. So, as we were saying, should the Cardinals, for example, lose the National League East by a game, they'll remember the game where riding a seven-game winning streak, they led the Reds 6-0 behind Joaquin Andahar and lost in extra innings. The Mets, on the other hand, will remember an extra inning loss this week to the Giants, the lowly Giants. If the Yankees overtake the Blue Jays and win a close race, they'll remember Ken Griffey's catch to save a game in the ninth inning against the Red Sox, a one-run game. So many like that. Well, the pressures are self-imposed. Each individual handle and team handles it differently. That ball hit him or did it. Now it just went foul. But as September approaches, you know, you're in April and you say, I know I'm going to get five to 600 at bats if you're a hitter. You know you're going to get 35 thereabouts starts as a pitcher, so many relief appearances. But as September gets upon you, you say, hey, I only got four at bats in the game. I got to make the best of them. Finish off my year as a pitcher. If you go in a little slump in the end, people remember it the rest of the year. So there is pressure. And the Blue Jays have a young team. Speaking about at bats and a race of a different kind, Wade Boggs is now hitting 359 to George Brett's 357 at the start of the day. If that winds up being decided by a point or two in Wade Boggs' favor. Yeah, George Brett will remember right. the game this week that was rained out after he'd gone two for two. A he had a single and a homer. Yep. And he lost those two base hits. Boggs was four for five last night against the Twins to jump in front of Brett in the race. Brett went one for two. Mullix is still way up tight. This could be a hit for Brian Little, and it is. A leadoff single in the eighth. Let's find out what the Yankees and Angels are up to. Here's Bill McAtee. All right, Robert, you mentioned the score earlier. Here's the home run from Pagliarillo. Randolph and Hassey were on, so once again, the Angels have to play catch-up. They're in the top of the sixth. It is 7-4. All right, and as Bill McAtee provided that information, Bobby Cox began a walk to the mound. Well, you've got Baines and Walker... Baines, obviously, is not going to sacrifice against a right-hander. Left-hander Gary Laval is out there, and Bobby Cox has already made the call. It's a 2-2 two -two ball game. Alexander has always been a pretty good finisher. Caught on the right-hander, but perhaps just to get two left-handed hitters out, Laval pitched to Baines and Walker. Interestingly, in that Alexander has handled Baines well in three at-bats, but Cox plays percentages here, and we'll be back to Exhibition Stadium in Toronto right after this break. Gary Lavelle getting loose for the Blue Jays. Bob Costas along with Tony Kubek. What do you have to say for yourself? 
I'm concerned about you this year on NFL 85. Oh, yeah? Do you have enough help with the axe? Ahmad, now you add Larry King. I mean, how many, people, how, many, up the troops. how many people can you carry on those weak little shoulders? <laughs> I was looking at it the other way around. I thought they'd be carrying me. All right, Lavelle faces Baines. Bench runner over there with a little bit more speed than Brian Little. The juice comes in, Julio Cruz. Baines to the opposite field, down the line, and a foul ball. Lavelle has had some control problems off and on this year. <laughs> The laugh you heard in the background as Cruz got down the third. They're laughing, but it's not funny. He's had knee surgery, and when he got the third and tried to stop on the turf, the knee gave out. He injured it. I don't know if, the, if he's wearing rubber cleats or metal cleats. If he's wearing metal cleats, which may be the case, they may have gotten caught when he tried to turn. Tony LaRusso will get out now. He had some arthroscopic surgery in the offseason, re-injured it off and on this year. I'm going to say Laval has had some control problems. It seems to me when I've seen him, it's been against left-handed hitters. It's one of the reasons he's here. Get a couple left-handed hitters out. The juice has really been drained last year in this. Had that big season in 83, big contract followed, and the production has dropped off sharply, both in terms of his hitting and his running game. Laval with his delivery. See that high leg kick?